Um, so welcome, welcome to the uh, webinar today. Um, uh, we're very grateful for you joining us. Maybe my panelists and, and co-host can uh, turn their video on for, for a few moments as we, as we get ourselves started. Um, first, just a couple points of housekeeping. Um, please uh, do be advised that we're keeping all of you on mute um, as participants in the webinar. Uh, this just for logistics. Please do use the question and answer tab below to send us questions, which we will be coming to at the last during the last session. And if you have any technical challenges, please do the, use the chat function. And we do have some technical support um, on hand today that can respond to those issues if you have some. My name is Lynette Neufeld. I'm from the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition. I'm a member of the Food Systems Summit Science Group and happy to be joining uh, and presenting this, this side event as a, as a um, this webinar, I should say, as a side event of the, the Food Systems Summit Science Days. Um, I'm sure you have all um, heard of them and, and seen that. Uh, there we go. Um, uh, I'm also incoming president of the International Union of Nutritional Sciences. My co-host today um, probably doesn't need an introduction for most of you. Dr. Anna Larty is the former director of nutrition at FAO. She is now a professor at the University of Ghana, and she's also past president of IUNS. Um, so we have a little shared uh, common history between us there. Um, we're very grateful for all of the great work that she's done um, during her term as IUNS and, and has left the organization in, in wonderful state for, for those of us moving in. Um, uh, before we get started, we did want to hear a little bit from you all. Um, so I'm going to launch a poll. And if you wouldn't mind uh, quickly just answering two questions, we're just curious to know where you're joining us from, uh, the nature of your organization and the field that you're working in. So I'm going to launch a poll and if you can just click on the responses, and then we'll we'll quickly get on to the um, we'll quickly get on to the uh, on to the session. So there you go. You can just um, respond. What sector do you work in primarily? Recognizing that many of you will be um, in multiple sectors, and what is your primary area of focus uh, across the different areas that we. Uh, indicated there and did leave an other as we anticipate we may not have been comprehensive in our listing. So it looks like about half of you have voted so far. We'll leave the poll on for another 30 seconds approximately um, to see if we can get a few more people responding. This is just, of course, for our information. We're curious to know who's joining us today. Okay, I'll turn the poll off in about another 10 seconds. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, looks like most people have voted. Um, so we'll just quickly share the results. Uh, we're about half of the participants from academia, uh, international organizations, one person from government, very welcome. Um, some national organizations, industry and other. Um, looks like we are about 42% from nutrition, but also from agriculture, food systems, an interest in climate or working in climate change public health. Great. It's wonderful to have you all here. Thank you for joining. Okay. So um, as you're all well aware, unhealthy diets are at the heart of all forms of malnutrition. And shifting trends towards healthier diets has been constrained by many factors. The Food Systems Summit and, uh, is hoping to substantially advance this agenda by accelerating commitments and action to transform food systems in favor of nutrition but importantly, also more broadly in favor of, of people and planet. In this session, we'll focus on healthy diets, exploring some of the gaps that are constraining progress to a characterizing healthy diets and to achieving them. We will hear from four speakers, after which Dr. Larty will provide some comments and reflections, 
and the two of us together will moderate a discussion, including responses to the questions that you, as many of your questions as we can. Um, to be aware, we will go straight uh, between the speakers, as opposed to uh, pausing for questions after each one. But please do write your questions in the Q&A tab, not in the chat, but in the Q&A tab. Um, and we can be monitoring those. Some we may respond to quickly if they're if they're details, um, and we'll be responding to as many as we can live in the in the discussion session at the end. As I mentioned at the beginning, please use the chat function if you have any logistical challenges or or uh, issues there. Um, so uh, let me introduce our our four speakers today. Um, and then we were going to go straight from each of their presentations right straight into the next one. So Dr. Jean-Claude uh, Mubarak uh, will speak to the topic of food processing and implications for characterizing healthy diets. Uh, Dr. Mubarak is an anthropologist and assistant professor in public and global health at the nutrition department at the University of Montreal. He's a regular researcher at the Center for Public Health Nutrition at the University of Montreal and uh, at the trans Newt Collaborating Center of the World Health Organization. He founded a Nova Lab Canada in 2020 and works mainly on ultra processed foods and food policies for healthy and sustainable food systems. We will next go to Dr. Noma Kolo Kovic, uh, who will speak to the topic of indigenous food systems and their potential for healthy diets and sustainable production. Now, Mokolo is a senior researcher, uh, res uh, excuse me, senior research coordinator at IFPRI on the CJIR program on agriculture for nutrition and health, A4NH, and is based in Ethiopia. She's a member of the IUNS Task Force on Traditional Indigenous Foods, the current president of the African Nutrition Society, and an editor for the Global Food Security Journal. Um, after Dr. Uh, Kovic, we will move on to Dr. Marco Springman, who is a senior researcher at the Newfield Department of Population Health at the University of Oxford in the UK, where he leads the research on environmental sustainability and public health. He is interested in the health, environmental, and economic dimensions of the global food system, and often uses systems models to provide quantitative estimates of food-related questions. In this session, he will speak to the topic of identifying and balancing food production and environmental trade-offs. And the final speaker will be Dr. William uh, Masters, who will speak to the topic of food prices, diet costs, and affordability. Dr. Masters is professor of food economics in the School of Nutrition at Tufts University, where he directs the Food Prices for Nutrition project, whose results he'll be sharing today. He is the former editor of the journal Agriculture Economics and an elected fellow of the Agriculture and Applied Economics Association. Welcome everyone. And with that, I would like to pass the word directly over to our first speaker. Please go ahead and share your screen and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, uh, Lynette, uh, for this introduction. Uh, can you all see my screen? Yes, very good. Thank you. Great. So uh, I'm glad to be here today and I'll be talking about uh, food processing and uh, implication for characterizing healthy diets. Um, and so um, let me start right away. Uh, we, uh, we know that the global pandemic uh, of obesity under nutrition and climate change of the Lancet Commission report uh, invites us to transform food systems so that they become more healthy and sustainable. And one of the major obstacles uh, is the, uh, of this transformation is political inertia, uh, namely the lack of will and coherence and, and perhaps of a holistic vision of healthy eating. And so um, one question I think that is important to ask is what are the changes that we need to make to food system? What, what do we need to change exactly? And I think that um, in terms of nutrition, um, we need to think in terms of food practices, uh, less in terms of nutrients and food and more in terms of food practices because uh, as an anthropologist, I appreciate the way humans are transforming their world and are transforming food. And so I think questions like how do we produce food are essential to ask. Uh, today I'll be talking about how we process food and how it matters to me uh, in nutrition. 
Uh, but there are other questions that are important to, to raise, such as how do we prepare and cook food? How do we eat? Uh, I think those are essential questions uh, if we are interested in human nutrition, because the human activity, I think, plays a, a, an important role in nutrition today. Um, and so today I'll be talking about a thesis that has been proposed uh, in 2009 by Professor Carlos Montero. In this uh, commentary, he was proposing that uh, a more than food and nutrient uh, uh, processing plays uh, a shaping forces in the global food system. And it, it's a main determinants of the quality of diets and related states of health and well-being. Um, today in, two, in, in 2021, we have gathered data uh, in, of course, uh, in the course of the last decades that allows us to, to, to state that, of course, food processing is important, is quite beneficial, even essential to human existence. Uh, but we have identified, we feel, uh, a type of processing that is mostly detrimental to human nutrition and health, namely ultra processing that I'll be talking about today. Uh, and research uh, has uh, uh, allowed us to identify uh, an important indicator of, of, uh, of diet quality, which is the caloric share of ultra processed food that can predict the overall quality of diets. Uh, and so uh, you have a couple of reference here talking, uh, that talks about the original commentary and um, a link to uh, a paper that summarizes the evidence that we have gathered over the last decade. Uh, but grossly, let me talk a little bit about ultra processing. Uh, we have uh, uh, studied uh, the, uh, food processing in, in different countries. Uh, this is Canada, where we have analyzed uh, the calories bought from stores since the early uh, 19th century up to uh, uh, today. And what we uh, can see is that throughout the history of, 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 uh, of, of, of Canada, uh, Canadians have uh, bought more and more ultra processed food. Uh, that's the, the, the red line. Uh, ultra processed food that has replaced unprocessed and minimally processed food and uh, ingredients that are used to prepare and cook food. And so what we can see is throughout uh, the 20th century, Canadians have bought less and less food and have uh, uh, changed those food for ultra processed food. And this is a, a tendency that we've seen in different countries. Uh, and right now, the, the growth of ultra processed food lies in the global south. Uh, you can see here uh, change uh, in, um, in the, the purchase of ultra processed food in different regions of the world from 2002 to 2016. And we can see that uh, in the high income countries of Western Europe, of North America and uh, Australia and New Zealand, uh, there is actually uh, not much of a growth. Actually, there is a decline in sales, whereas uh, the growth lies in the global south region of the world where population are cooking less and less and are uh, 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 shifting from uh, 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 diets that are based on cooked food from diets that are based on ultra-processed food. So what are ultra-processed food? Uh, ultra-processed food are defined according to the NOVA classification uh, that you can read below. Uh, I won't go uh, uh, through the whole classification, uh, but the classification divides all food and drinks into four major group, uh, and one of those groups are ultra-processed products. Um, ultra-processed products are not foods that are prepared or preserved. They are products that are made from scratch from a collection of refined substance and cosmetic additives. Uh, ultra-processed food comes from the fractioning of food into substance and the use of those substances to create products that are ready for consumption. Uh, the ingredients and production techniques uh, used in the production of ultra processed food uh, reduce cost while making products uh, quite convenient and very attractive. Uh, and they are uh, marketed through uh, sophisticated marketing strategies. Uh, so basically ultra processed food are products that are quite colorful. They, are, uh, they come with characters and slogan, uh, and they have typically a long list of ingredients where, where you're gonna see a lot of refined substances and additives. Uh, basically in this category, uh, you will find uh, most of the uh, uh, sugary drinks and soft drinks, 
uh, commercial cookies and cakes and snacks, uh, frozen foods. Uh, you, you'll find also uh, milk-based product. Uh, basically, uh, every food that we know can be ultra-processed. Uh, so on the market, you can have uh, yogurts uh, uh, that are millimeter process, uh, processed and others that are ultra-processed with the characteristic that ultra-processed food uh, uh, relies on those substances and additives such as colors, flavors, uh, and they tend to be quite rich in salt, sugar, and fat. Um, currently, there is a multi-country study on ultra-processed food intake, diet quality, and obesity, uh, uh, led by Carlos Montero uh, in Brazil. I lead the Canadian component. Uh, and um, so far, uh, it's been uh, uh, several years since this study has started. And some of the uh, um, evidence are summarized in this FAO report. So let me give, uh, give you a summary of the research. Uh, um, so over the last decade, um, uh, using uh, national uh, representative surveys, uh, we have shown that the more ultra processed food is consumed, the less is the overall nutritional quality of diets. Uh, basically, the more ultra processed food is consumed, the more free sugar, sodium, saturated fat uh, is consumed and the more uh, dense is the energy of the diet. Um, also, the more ultra processed food is consumed, the less minerals, vitamins, protein and fiber uh, is consumed. Uh, this leads to uh, a relationship with, with health. Uh, the more ultra processed food is consumed, the less healthy is the overall diet. We've seen uh, in different uh, countries research that have linked ultra processed food consumption with a higher risk of obesity, uh, of diabetes, hypertension, a higher risk of mortality, uh, but also uh, more depression symptoms and other health problems. And, and basically, it, may, it might be surprising to see that all those health factors are related to a single type of product. But if we uh, 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 keep in mind that those products are uh, often rich in, in salt, sugar, and fat, and they are uh, often made to be quite uh, uh, appealing, uh, they tend to, to favor overconsumption. And so it's not surprising that those products are linked to several uh, health outcomes because they do have several nutritional uh, problems as well. And so we've come up with this proposal that the caloric share of ultra processed food can be used as an overall indicator of diet quality and health. Uh, and basically uh, it is an important dimension of the unhealthy dimension of diet. And currently screeners are being developed to, um, to, um, to uh, be able to gather information on ultra processed food consumption. Uh, but uh, using screeners that are, are more quick and, and, and rapid to use in Canada, Brazil, and elsewhere. Uh, just some example of the relationship between uh, consumption of ultra-processed food and nutritional outcomes. So uh, uh, data from multiple countries uh, are used here to show that the more ultra-processed food is consumed, the higher a free sugar intake is. Um, and another example here, uh, the more ultra-processed food is consumed, in those countries, the less is the fiber intake in the diet. Uh, another uh, example here from Canada, uh, this is a cross-sectional survey uh, where we've uh, uh, classified Canadians according to the consumption of ultra-processed food. And we see that the higher uh, intake of ultra-processed food is associated with a higher risk of obesity, diabetes, and high blood pressure. Um, also, uh, quickly, ultra-processed food uh, is linked to, uh, 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 will contribute directly to the climate crisis. This hasn't been quite demonstrated yet, but we know that the more energy and water is used in processing, the more uh, impact you can have on, on uh, climate change. And so in conclusion, uh, I think we need to devise public policies to bring back cooking and real food into our lives. Uh, and so the golden rule here that we have in the uh, dietary guidelines of uh, the Brazilian population is to always prefer those freshly prepared food and dishes uh, to over uh, ultra processed food. And lastly, uh, we wrote a commentary with uh, John Adams and Susan Hoffman and other colleagues where we uh, provide strategies uh, 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 for our food system to bring back cooking 
and real food into our institution. And uh, uh, the conclusion is that uh, I think handmade food, uh, traditional food uh, are uh, the, the most healthy food uh, on the planet and ultra processed food is uh, the culprit of our modern diet. And so we need to shift this uh, transition so we can bring back cooking into our lives. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm sorry I went a little over the time. Thank you very much. Um, pass along the word directly to Dr. Kovic. And while she's getting set up, please everyone do remember if you have questions, do type them into the Q&A uh, tab at the bottom of the screen. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, my presentation is going to be on um, indigenous food systems and their potential to, for healthy diets and sustainable production. Um, I take an African lens to the, uh, my presentation. Um, I'm struggling with the... Okay. Thank you. I will take a, a, an African lens to, the, to, to my presentation. And really, the first thing I want to look at is, so, so what term do I use is, is one of the questions I asked myself as I was preparing for this presentation. Um, indigenous implies uh, foods uh, that are um, of genetic origin in the area where they are being produced. Um, traditional normally encompasses foods that may have come into the particular uh, area or territory, but which have been there for a long time and have become part of traditional food culture in the area. And so my preferred term is actually to use traditional and indigenous foods, and specifically using an African lens, because we do have a lot of foods that are not necessarily of African origin that have become part of our traditional uh, food systems. And so I will tend to talk about traditional and indigenous uh, food systems and foods and not just uh, indigenous. I want to also start by looking at key messages that I hope I can leave with you today. Uh, the first is that our traditional and indigenous food systems are associated with foods that are offer opportunities for sustainable healthy diets um, and, and here you see a woman with dried up greeny leafy uh, vegetables that can take us um, into drought uh, periods that can take us out of normal growing seasons providing food security over longer periods of time our traditional and indigenous foods are also a resource base that we should really not ignore because there's a lot of biodiversity that is associated with them. And we must therefore urgently seek to understand the role they can play in, in getting a better food systems transformation uh, in terms of the efforts that we are, we are now making. I, I say this uh, bearing in mind uh, this type of scenario where we have really lost a lot of uh, plant species over time uh, from thousands to the fact that we are now relying primarily on three uh, cereal crops and 12 other crops. Uh, this is not healthy because the implication is the other things that we are not paying attention to, we are going to lose. And this is the case with our traditional uh, food systems uh, on the African continent. There's work that has been done by Akinola and others recently in 2020, when they've done quite an extensive uh, review of African traditional and indigenous food crops um, in, and looking at multiple uses. Uh, and really, the, the, the information that comes out of there is the fact that our indigenous food crops can actually enhance our food basket. 
um, but that we do also have a major obstacle in that the potential benefits of these foods uh, for food security and nutrition, as well as the role they can play in sustainability and resilience are not valued as they should. But also that we are also losing knowledge between generations. A lot of our, our food uh, knowledge is embedded uh, in, in folklore and in, in stories that have been passed from one generation to another. They are not captured in journal articles and we are losing that knowledge. So there is actually need in, the, in, in this particular review, they call uh, upon everyone to do more on the African continent to preserve the indigenous food crops that we have got, as well as the traditional crops that we have adopted over uh, many years. Um, we had several independent dialogues on the African continent that have also touched on this. And essentially it's the same outcomes of this review that we have picked up as well. This is extracted from Mamura's uh, article in, in Lancet in 2015, where they look at the dietary patterns, uh, first of all, uh, across, I think, 187 countries. In characterization of these dietary patterns, they look at uh, countries that show more healthy items in the, in the foods that they consume. And the greener the country looks, the more healthy um, items are in there. And you can see that the bulk of the green tinge that you see in this map is actually on the African continent. So there are some healthy items that we've got. When you look at dietary patterns based on unhealthy items, again, you see the green being the best in terms of um, having uh, the, the least amount of unhealthy items, you can actually see that the African continent, again, is faring uh, quite well. And, and, and this then brings me to the issue that I talked about earlier in the review to say, this is what we are losing by ignoring traditional and indigenous food systems and the value that they can actually add to the transformation processes that we are now uh, seeking through the UN Food Systems Summit process. Recently in 2019, FAO looked at um, FAO and WHO had an expert group that looked at sustainable uh, healthy diets guiding principles. These principles looked at two dimensions of sustainability. One is uh, sustainability as well as the healthiness of the diet. They also looked at the fact that we needed to contextualize how we translate sustainability of diets to different country settings. And this really speaks to the UN Food Systems Summit process in that we do need to look at those traditional and indigenous food systems and consumption patterns that exist, that are actually healthful, that should be informing the transformations that we seek. And that in doing so, we need to think of ethnographic modules as part of our food consumption surveys. And this is taking into account the fact that most of the knowledge is actually not documented as such in books and, and, and articles. There was also attention to territorial diets, and they looked at uh, the Japanese diet, the Mediterranean diet, the traditional Nordic diet, and the new version of it. And it is very clear here that the Mediterranean diet has indeed uh, received accolades in terms of health benefits. What I want to try and say to you is that traditional and indigenous diets in South America, uh, native North American territories and in Africa also have something to offer and they really need to be looked to uh, for solutions. Here, I just wanna 
really emphasize this statement from IFAD that uh, traditional and indigenous territories are home to 80% of our world's uh, biodiversity. This is the biodiversity that is the source of our food uh, biodiversity as well. And by ignoring these traditional and indigenous food systems in these territories, we actually are setting ourselves for losses in future in not being able to maintain our food biodiversity over time in our food systems uh, globally. There are a lot, a lot of challenges though that are being faced. One is limited research attention focusing uh, in it because it focuses on just a few uh, crops and, and, and foods. The other is not valuing the loss of knowledge that is actually taking place that requires ethnographic research to make sure that we stop losing the knowledge that we've got to be able to support a food systems transformation that can uh, benefit from uh, what exists. There is also a need to better understand uh, traditional dietary patterns that are associated with traditional indigenous food systems to describe those benefits. Um, and, and here I indicate that it's not always benefits. There might be things that we might need to improve upon, but unless we study these traditional dietary patterns, we will not be able to benefit from that knowledge. Uh, the issue of nutritional composition data uh, has been a challenge and, and that more needs to be done here. Uh, if, we need, if we know about the composition, then we can actually do more with the traditional foods. And then, of course, there is the relentless advertising favoring uh, dietary transition uh, that, you, that we should be running away from. I showed you how Africa looks the greenest when you look to unhealthy uh, items in diets. Unfortunately, we are all now in transition towards the unhealthy foods, and part of this is driven by the type of advertising that uh, is taking place. So it is necessary for uh, traditional foods also that are harvested from the wild for uh, plant breeders and others to come on board to actually work on um, efforts so that these can be produced uh, more sustainably if we harvest uh, more from the wild. And so we need ethnographic knowledge gathering approaches. And here I have simply copied this paragraph that I think really makes the case very well uh, for indigenous uh, people's food systems that our knowledge is in stories, songs, folklore, uh, proverbs, dance, etc. It's stuff that you do not uh, run a survey on. And therefore, looking at this as, as an option of, of trying to gather knowledge that will help us in transforming food systems in such a way that we carry knowledge from traditional and indigenous food systems that we will otherwise lose is actually critical. There are also opportunities for us to do better. The UN Food Systems Summit process that has gathered us together today is one uh, grand opportunity to do better. We can reset to make sure that we can pay greater attention to these uh, food systems. There are also other instru instruments that we can build upon. Uh, I already gave the example of the sustainable healthy diets uh, guiding principles uh, from FAO and WHO. Uh, the CFS voluntary guidelines on sustainable food systems for nutrition can also build on traditional food systems in, in according to context in different countries. There are multiple policy instruments that countries have of relevance where they talk about promoting uh, traditional uh, consumption patterns, but where there's not enough efforts, especially from research, to get the most out of that. On the African continent, we have regional programs of the African Union, such as the, uh, the Comprehensive Africa Agriculture Development Program that actually talks about promoting indigenous and, and traditional foods. Uh, 
And in addition to that, there is an orphan crops uh, institute uh, on the African continent that is trying to preserve uh, traditional foods. Uh, I must add though that I don't particularly like the term orphan crop because it implies uh, somebody that is unwanted somehow. And, and I think it is important for us to, to think of our traditional and indigenous foods with great value. And then finally, the food-based dietary guidelines, I think are a great opportunity uh, in particular for the African continent. I say so because only seven African countries actually have um, food-based dietary guidelines out of 54 countries. This to me is an opportunity because all those other countries that have had food-based dietary guidelines and have not gotten as much benefit from them because they have not been used appropriately are lessons for us to do better. So as we begin to develop our food-based dietary guidelines, we can do better and perhaps we can also ensure that our traditional and indigenous foods are part of the guidelines that we actually develop. I want to finish off by drawing attention to three independent dialogues that uh, carry some key messages uh, from Africa that are relevant to our discussions today. One was on multi-sectoral food systems action, ensuring Africa's capacity to generate the needed evidence. And here, it's really the issue of we need to generate capacity for us to be able to draw our traditional and indigenous foods into our food systems transformation. So there's already a recognition for this on the African continent. The second was one on traditional and indigenous foods for food systems transformation in Africa that was done jointly between the African Nutrition Society and the IUNS Task Force on Traditional and Indigenous Foods. A lot was shared here, looking at issues, including uh, recent developments with culinary tourism and issues around uh, uh, ensuring how can we pro produce seeds for some of the indigenous foods, uh, sustainability where we are actually uh, getting food from the wild, as well as if industry comes on board, what type of policy instruments do we need to ensure that there is equity of benefits to those indigenous communities that have relied on these foods for, for many years. And the third was on imagining Africa's food systems transformation through data advocacy and leadership. And here again, the issue of traditional and indigenous foods was addressed to say this must become part of our toolkit towards transforming Africa's food systems to deliver better diets. On that, I say thank you. Thank you very much. We'll move straight into the presentation by uh, Dr. Springman. Uh, hello, everybody, and thanks for having me today. Uh, I hope you can see my presentation now. Just, uh, to full screen. You can see? Yes, very good. Thank yeah, you. Okay, perfect. So um, my presentation will be more about the environmental implications of diets and food production uh, in general. Um, as a bit of, a, of background, um, you might have heard this already a couple of times, but uh, I think one can say without a doubt that the current food system is uh, environmentally unsustainable. It's a major driver of climate change with about a third of all greenhouse gas emissions um, uh, due to the food system. It's a major driver of land use change and thereby biodiversity loss with at least 40% of the Earth's land surface, uh, Earth's surface uh, occupied by food production. It's also a major user of fresh water resources uh, and a major polluter of terrestrial and aquatic systems through fertilizer runoff, which already has contributed to quite a number of dead zones in uh, coastal oceans. Um, 
we estimated that without dedicated measures, um, we really run the risk that uh, not only do would environmental impacts increase, uh, we put a, an estimate on it uh, that uh, indicated an increase of 50 to 90% of all on all of those dimensions, but we also would run the risk of uh, transgressing key planetary boundaries of the food systems. Uh, of the food system. Those are environmental limits related to climate change, land use change, uh, change water use, and uh, nitrogen and phosphorus application related to fertilizer applic uh, application. So as an example, if uh, we would for, uh, uh, transgress the planetary boundary for climate change, you would expect more extreme weather events, for example, and all the, all the things associated with those. Uh, to analyze options for staying within those environmental limits of the food system, we built a um, comprehensive food system model that connected food consumption and the health impacts on the one side with food production and the environmental impacts on the other side. We use detailed land use uh, and water use maps, uh, maps of greenhouse gas emissions of livestock, of greenhouse gas emissions of crops, uh, fertilizer application uh, data, where those end up and what they do to, uh, uh, to um, uh, water bodies, uh, detailed socioeconomic projections, um, and uh, a range of scenarios that were designed to study how much uh, uh, the environmental impacts could be mitigated with uh, a range of options. Together with this model, we found that uh, we could indeed avert a situation where we would transgress those planetary boundaries uh, to a situation where we could just about make, make it to stay within those. But for that, um, uh, what was needed were uh, not only technical options that are very often discussed, but also reductions in food loss and waste, better socioeconomic de development, and um, uh, dietary changes towards more plant-based diets. Um, here's a composition of uh, what measure was needed for what environmental domain. And as you can see here, technical options were very um, um, efficient for reducing the environmental impacts when it came to cropland use, water use, and fertilizer application. And the reason here is that um, there are good options for, for example, increasing yield of, uh, or for better irrigation measurements and also for nitrogen and phosphorus recycling. But for uh, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, those really don't exist. They are the number one option that was needed were dietary changes towards more plant-based diets. The reason for that is that uh, about 80% uh, of uh, all food-related emissions are due to animal source foods. And those animal source foods um, can't be tremendously much improved when it comes to emissions. You can change the feed rations a little bit, but uh, any, uh, for example, a cow would still uh, burp up quite a bit of methane emissions and uh, any animal needs a multiple of feed to put up uh, um, um, an equivalent unit of body weight. So even though there is some wiggling room, the efficiency of those uh, technical or farm level changes is really rather limited when you compare them to, to other environmental domains. So said in a different way, without dietary changes towards the more plant-based diets, there is hardly any chance of staying within the uh, two degree or 1.5 degree limit of the Paris Climate Agreement. And, and that's very clearly what we, what we found here. What kind of dietary changes are we talking about? Well, the ones that we modeled in that study were from, uh, that study was part of the Eat Lancet Commission on Healthy Diets from Sustainable Food Systems. And we indeed took the uh, dietary recommendations uh, of that commission uh, um, as, as a point of reference for, for this scenario. Um, the, the recommendations were based on a very comprehensive review of the literature on healthy eating uh, and healthy body weight and based on that put together recommendations for predominantly plant-based dietary patterns in the least in stringent version that meant not having more than one serving of red meat per week not having more than two servings of poultry per week not having more than two servings of fish per week uh, not having more than one serving of dairy per day and basically having plenty of fruits vegetables legumes nuts and seeds um, the um to make sure that um 
those recommendations were also healthy. We uh, did a full nutritional analysis for every country and indeed found that nutritional um, uh, intake would be improved in, in this um, uh, for the dietary patterns that are in line with, um, uh, with those recommendations. Uh, we did a, a mortality analysis where we modeled uh, the burden of, of diet-related diseases associated with dietary changes. And here we found that um, uh, roughly 20% of premature mortality could be avoided if uh, uh, one were to adapt uh, those dietary recommendations for either flexitarian, vegetarian, pescatarian, or vegan dietary patterns. Um, but I guess the big question is here, um, okay, if we know these dietary patterns are uh, fairly sustainable uh, and they're also fairly healthy, what dietary changes, uh, how do those compare to what is eaten at the moment? And here you see uh, percentage consumption changes uh, projected to 2030 to reach those flexitarian diets. And what you can see is that uh, compared to um, projected diets, there would need to be an over 80% reduction in red meat, a third reduction in uh, dairy, and quite substantial increases in fruit and vegetable consumption. Not only in high-income countries, where diets are relatively more imbalanced, but also in low-income countries, which are projected to actually uh, exceed those, uh, those limits that I just spelled out. Uh, that also means there need to be a concomitant change in production. Instead of ever producing more stable crops, sugar, and, and animal source foods, what we really need, we really don't need more of those, but we really need more fruits, vegetables, legumes, nuts, and seeds um, if we calculated what are the produ production needs to supply those healthy and sustainable diets between now and 2050. Now, one can, of course, ask how sensitive are those recommendations? So we did model, for example, uh, a, a doubling of red meat or a doubling of dairy intake. And with those doublings, uh, basically the, um, um, those environmental limits that I talked about would be easily transgressed. Another point of comparison is if we look at food-based dietary guidelines around the world and what, what those uh, recommend and see whether that is healthy and sustainable. Uh, for that, we recently mapped the planetary boundaries and environmental limits that we specified within the Eat Lancet Commission to um, uh, policy targets like the Paris Climate Agreement, the IG Biodiversity Target, and the Sustainable Development Goals when it comes to uh, water withdrawals, nutrient pollution, as well as the NCD agenda to also have health aspects represented. And analyzing all uh, dietary guidelines that we could get data for, we found that hardly any were uh, actually in line with those global uh, environmental and health targets, um, specifically those not in high income countries. Um, as a number, 98% were uh, not in line with all, uh, uh, with all of those targets and over two thirds were only in line with one or two. Um, here you see where those culprits were. Most of the um, uh, deviation uh, when it comes to the target value, which should be at 100, came from uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the North American dietary guidelines were particularly bad. And if you look at where, uh, what food groups those came from, well, it's basically animal source food. So this is beef here, uh, uh, dark red and uh, dairy, the light, light blue. So only uh, dietary recommendations that had uh, more stringent limits, not necessarily zero, but stringent, more stringent limits, uh, really were able to stay within those dietary, uh, within those uh, environmental and health targets. At the same time, uh, we found that uh, if one were to go towards those more progressive dietary recommendations, like those Eat Lancet recommendations, then also um, the healthiness of those uh, would be improved by about a third on average, uh, but by quite some amount in every region that we analyzed here. And we have country level data for all of this, if anybody is interested. Um, so the takeaway message here really is that um, uh, so Potential changes towards healthier and more plant-based diets are needed uh, uh, to stay within food, uh, within food related planetary boundaries and environmental limits. Uh, current diets and uh, dietary recommendations are not sustainable due to the lack of clear limits on animal source foods, uh, and they could be healthier. 
Coherent policy incentives are needed to support changes in both food consumption, but also food production. And uh, things that might be of use here are um, reform of dietary guidelines to really uh, have uh, recommendations on all food groups and to offer a range of uh, exemplary dietary patterns, for example, that would be in line with uh, guidelines. A full costing of foods that includes the health and environmental costs, because very often, uh, uh, and we will hear more of that from, from Will in the next talk, very often uh, what is healthy and sustainable might not be the cheapest in all regions, and uh, a full costing of foods could help here. And then lastly, also a reform of agricultural subsidies, because at the moment, uh, farmers get money, uh, not necessary to grow the wrong stuff, but uh, they don't, they are not rewarded for growing things that are relatively more needed in a healthy and sustainable food system, and that would need to be rectified as well. Uh, thank you very much for listening, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Excellent. So I'll follow directly from that. Um, and first of all, to really thank Lynette and Anna Larty for organizing this. The IUNS is really a remarkable organization. Look forward to meeting in person, but especially to the participants also to thank you for taking the time to join in this conversation. We're able to have a much more inclusive uh, kind of dialogue in the run up to this food system summit. Uh, you don't need to travel, but you do need to take the time. So thank you for taking the time to, to participate and for typing uh, in the Q&A box. We have a number of people have already typed things and that's really helpful. So look forward to seeing more thoughts uh, perhaps about, about this. Um, so I'm going to add another dimension to think about the um, how to make healthy diets affordable and accessible to all with adding up food prices in terms of diet costs to think about relative to incomes, are these items affordable? Uh, so this is part of the Food Prices for Nutrition project that uh, Lynette mentioned at the outset. What we've brought is a set of new methods that reveal whether a country's food system uh, at any place, at any time within the country brings an overall healthy diet within reach. So building on what Jean-Claude said about processing and understanding Namakolo's comments about diversity of foods, looking across all these, including indigenous foods, uh, including some animal source foods within the environmental limits that, um, that Marco just talked about, uh, what are the barriers to access? Because we recognize that the costs of these more expensive uh, food groups can be absolutely prohibitive. It's just simply impossible to afford them if incomes are, are too low. And what we need to do is to take account of the fact that at each market location, uh, at a, a wet market, a periodic market in a rural area, uh, a small town market, there'll be many items available. They vary in price, vary in composition uh, in terms of nutrients and vary in terms of processing as Jean-Claude was, was describing. So behind uh, the, the perhaps African indigenous vegetables, you might have um, ultra processed foods as Jean-Claude was, was mentioning. And what we wanna do is to think about the cost barriers in a systematic way where we can use existing price data being collected all around the world by national statistical organizations, the national governments, uh, and, and international agencies also, uh, take all of the prices that are available, collecting as much price data as possible, matching items to food composition to think about nutrients, matching items to food groups to think about dietary guidelines. Um, and we identify the cost barrier, thinking about the least cost way of meeting these goals. So that answers this question, which steps are affordable towards higher uh, levels of diet quality in terms of first uh, calories for daily subsistence and then essential nutrients, uh, a least cost diet for nutrient adequacy. Um, and then more expensive is meeting dietary guidelines. Uh, and then we recognize, of course, that there are many other kinds of goals uh, regarding time use. We'll talk about fuel in a moment uh, and consumer preferences and so forth. And this line of work has led to a lot of discovery that I'll just share very briefly with you today, including especially the FAO, uh, WFP, UNICEF, uh, SOFI report, together with other UN agencies trying to measure the world food system in a, in a new way. So what did we discover? The central idea is this, that if we think about the cost of each step on that ladder, we find costs of survival in internationally comparable terms are about 75 US cents a day in current US dollars. 
And that represents the bare minimum above which one would need to have uh, entitlements, some kind of access, perhaps food aid, but uh, without that, it's impossible to survive uh, from day to day. To get to nutrient adequacy is something like $2 a day, a bit more than the $1.90 World Bank poverty line, but to get to recommended diets is quite a lot more. And the central problem here is that even these least cost items that you would see here in each, uh, in each food group, the least cost items are similar prices for lower and higher income people. And so there is this similarity in the cost level of the diet, except for what we notice is slightly lower prices in the very richest countries in the world because they have the uh, highly capital intensive, highly specialized systems for dairy that bring dairy products uh, at, at, at a lower price. Otherwise, very similar prices around the world. So with low incomes in, uh, in Africa and South Asia, you see increasing fractions of the population unable to reach those higher rungs of that ladder where uh, above 75% of all people in, in Africa and South Asia unable to afford the healthy diet. And that leads to this headline number from the 2020 SOFI last year at this time, uh, the UN system announced that 3 billion people could not afford this healthy diet. And that results from, from these calculations. That's a really interesting way of comparing a food system lens for this food system summit that this, that this dialogue and side event uh, are, are, are informing to, to compare this nutritional view of food systems to other ways of thinking about poverty. So we're comparing it to the $1.90 poverty line of the World Bank, to the undernourishment, the prevalence of undernourishment metric that the uh, FAO has been using since the 1960s uh, and that, that focuses on calories, of course, and the experience of food insecurity, the food insecurity experience scale of the FAO that uh, asked people, did you go to bed hungry? Did you skip a meal? Did you uh, not know where food was coming from due to lack of income? We see that that's a, a different number. It's different uh, in nature than this uh, unaffordability of a healthy diet. So this is really a, a new way of thinking about food systems in terms of all the food groups. And there will be a new update of the SOFI uh, the SOFI 2021 will have updates of these data, but of course we don't yet have data on the horrendous effects of, of the COVID pandemic, which undoubtedly is turning a lot of countries, uh, a darker shade of orange here uh, with a larger number of people. We just don't know how many more uh, because of both lower incomes uh, and to some extent higher prices. Um, we find a lot of interesting uh, variation within countries. So here's an example of a study that looks at Tanzania, Malawi, Ethiopia. Here you see the overall mix of foods for nutrient adequacy. You see the seasonality in the cost of nutrient adequacy is, is greater than the seasonality of any within, uh, uh, any within food group because they're synchronized. Uh, and you see the differences across regions. So a lot of rich description of food systems is possible through this method. We, are expanding from just the cost of the items at the market, a periodic market, a wet market, uh, sometimes a small grocery store. Uh, we're looking beyond that to other aspects of meal preparation. So this is a uh, some food sum system summit brief uh, that we just prepared working with the World Food Program to think about basic meals that the World Food Program is working on uh, and thinking about the fuel use within countries uh, across East Africa and how the cost of fuel actually rivals the cost of the product itself uh, and trying to understand just how difficult it is for people to do meal preparation uh, in terms of fuel use. We're also looking at time use um, and, and, and water as well. So our main result here is that these cost foods to meet health needs vary, but they're not less expensive in low-income countries. So this shows you the observations for each country in the world at each income level. National income varies by a factor of 100 from about $2 a day to $200 a day in the richest countries. And you see calorie adequacy around 75 cents on average here, nutrient adequacy around $2 here, and healthy diets uh, around uh, averaging a little less than $4 here. So a natural question is, does adding sustainability criteria raise diet costs? And here we have the costing of that Eat Lancet reference diet. This is the flexitarian version of what Marco just described here. What we see is greater variation around the world because the purple 
the healthy diet is a blend of many dietary guidelines, whereas the Eat Lancet is just one. So there's more variation in the green uh, st stars here for the, but the average at each level of income is actually very similar, really identical between uh, the Eat Lancet reference diet and an overall healthy diet. Uh, and the reason is that least cost healthy diets already use very few resources. They use little water, little soil, and in particular, very little uh, livestock. Very, very little animal source foods are needed to actually meet dietary guidelines when you look at the least cost ones. So clearly people are choosing uh, to eat these other foods, not for health purposes, uh, but for other reasons. So what's the bottom line? Using consumer prices yields some very surprising results. We've been studying prices for many, many years, decades really, uh, centuries even, but discovering how they map to nutrients and to food groups has led to some really remarkable new understanding of food systems. And in particular, this idea that many people, something like 40% of the world population, simply cannot afford all these food groups. It's just not possible. Their incomes are too low. And the basic reason is that these perishable and bulky foods are just more costly to grow and distribute. It's not, it's not, that it, it's not a policy choice is that they're simply difficult to do. It's harder to make them, harder to distribute them, harder to get them into the locations and the time periods uh, where people are, are need, to, need to acquire them. So affordability requires income growth. It requires transfers. Social protection is crucial for nutrition. Social protection and safety nets are the key first step towards reaching nutritional goals. Without social protection, without safety nets, without uh, income, it's not possible for people to acquire enough of these expensive but nutritious uh, food groups. At the same time, there's a lot of innovation within food systems, within food systems to lower the prices of these healthier, healthier foods. Uh, and we also find this crucial point that adding sustainability criteria uh, doesn't make a difference here when we're looking at the least cost items because the purchase of the unsustainable items is not driven by, uh, by health needs, it's driven by other things. So, What's going on? Clearly, for most of the world, something like 60% of the world's population, uh, healthy diets could be chosen, but they're not what people consume. The price barrier is uh, not the barrier that, that is insurmountable, it's other factors that are driving choice. So what are those preferences, meal preparation, and clearly the overwhelming force, the, the tremendous, tremendous force of the marketing of packaged foods uh, that Jean-Claude uh, mentioned at the, at the outset. In terms of availability, in terms of advertising, uh, that really makes it very hard to choose the, the healthy foods, even though they are available at, at the marketplace as well. So COVID had huge effects. We don't know how big those are. Uh, we are studying that certainly, and, uh, and we believe it's very large, but we, we do not know. So next steps, thinking about how to make sure that countries are able to use this kind of estimate to guide policy. Um, we will be building a nutrition data hub that will be at the World Banks uh, alongside the World Development Indicators and other measures of the overall health of the world economy. We'll be looking at the health of food systems uh, through this mechanism and the SOFI 2021 and other uh, reports will be, uh, we believe, also highlighting um, this way of thinking about overall costs across all food groups. We're also uh, working within countries to think about how spatial and regional variation within countries uh, can be addressed um, and look forward to uh, conversation with each of you in the Q&A uh, now and, and over time. This is a very big project, so lots of people um, and funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation as well as the UK government. So thanks very much for the opportunity to share this with you now. Thank you very much. Um, I know my uh, co-moderator has had some internet issues. Anna, are you ready to go? Excellent. Yes, I'm Wonderful. here. Great. Thank you. Great. Yeah. yeah, it's been really exciting uh, presentations uh, we have had uh, from our panelists. Um, I think many of them have highlighted the gaps in healthy diets. You know, we see that it's not just very easy to just say that people should access healthy diets. There are so many dimensions to it that we really need, need to look, look at. So in my intervention, I would like to emphasize that by, uh, despite these gaps, what we don't know, and, and the fact that there's a lot that we need to address, I think that we still know enough to actually move forward with the evidence that we have. 
I think that by not moving forward with what we know, it's actually going to cost us dearly. We cannot say that, you know, we don't know enough and therefore we will not do what we need to do. I mean, if you look at the current situation, which has been highlighted in this presentation, we see that there has been a focus on food systems and its inability to deliver on healthy diets. And the world is off track to meet almost all of the global nutrition targets, mainly again, because of several reasons, but healthy diets play a big role in this, that we are not able to meet our nutrition target. The Eat Lancet paper that was published in 2019 and was mentioned uh, in some of the presentations really made a, a great emphasis that the way we produce and consume our food is damaging our health and is also damaging the planet. That's, it is not surprising that there is this great call to change the way we produce food and also the way we consume food. It's very important. This has been uh, highlighted or uh, mentioned by one of the presenters that the analysis show that if we are able to change the way, especially the way we consume our food, there are substantial health benefits. And the analysis that were done by different groups says that we could actually save 11 million premature deaths a year, you know, just by changing the way we eat and we shift to a more healthy, healthy diet. And, and in Marco's presentation, he highlighted some of the shifts that we should be looking at in, in our diets, you know, the shifts that we need to look at. And I will not mention this too, uh, too much. But I think that COVID-19, we are still in the midst of COVID. COVID, the pandemic has showed how critical a healthy diet is. Those who succumbed to severe and, uh, symptoms and hospitalization were those who did not, who had a diet with, uh, were those with underlying conditions related to healthy diet. So it actually costs us a lot if we do not put this access, you know, affordability of healthy diet at the top of the food systems transformation that, that we are talking about. Now, making this shift towards healthy diet is not an option, but it is a necessity now, looking at where we are now. I think governments must lead. Governments have a role to play in putting the right policies in place to get all sectors working together towards achieving the healthy diets we want. You know, policies to make nutrient-rich foods available. Agricultural policies have been mentioned, and this should focus not only on staple crops, but also some of the nutritious foods we are talking about. We need policies that will change the food environment. You know, this has been mentioned in the presentation of Jean-Claude. You know, the food environment is very important. And how do we factor this in, in our definition of, of, of our healthy diets? We also need the supportive development of food-based dietary guidelines. This has been mentioned by several presenters. Food-based dietary guidelines are very important tools for government to say that this is how we want our citizens to eat, and therefore, it will guide our procurement and institutional feeding policies. We also need to pay attention to our smallholder farmers. In fact, the ingredients of a healthy diet, a lot of it are actually produced by our smallholder farmers. How do we make sure that they are taken care of, they are linked to markets, and therefore the foods they produce will continue to remain uh, affordable because they do not lose a lot of it in food, wastes, in food waste and loss. Then also our trade policies should focus on support to healthy diets. They should not make highly processed food available and cheap, but they should also support healthy diets. Government should support infrastructure development, especially for smallholder farmers. Roads, when they produce these foods, they should be able to get them to the market, access to market, and also cold chains will be needed to uh, uh, preserve the lives of these nutritious foods. Scientists and researchers have a big role to play in that they should put the evidence in the form that policymakers can take for decision making. Consumers need to be empowered to make the right decisions. I'll say that ultimately, you know, consumers will control their own health and well being. With the right information, it will support their decision, decision making. We have global opportunities. These have been mentioned by Namokolo and others that there are global opportunities 
for us to really move with this healthy diet. And the Food System Summit is one great opportunity that we can use to come to consensus about all aspects of healthy diet that has been mentioned here. But most likely we will not. I don't think we will come to consensus on all these aspects. But it doesn't matter if we do not come to consensus. I think we have enough information to move forward as we grapple with the cost and the gaps and the contentions that we are talking about. Issues about sustainability, issues about how to incorporate traditional and indigenous foods into the sustainable and the healthy diets we are talking about, processing issues, and also how to bring healthy diets within reach. I'd like to uh, 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 bring attention to the Global Panel's Foresight Report to on future of food systems. And they recommend that possibly we could look at an intergovernmental mechanism similar to the uh, IPCC, that for climate change, to help come to consensus on scientific evidence as well as resolving controversies. Um, if we cannot come to consensus on the scientific evidence and to resolve the controversies around healthy diets, I think that we are actually setting a stage for inaction, you know, and also inefficient policies. And so we really need to look at how to move forward. And the Food Systems Summit should provide us with the opportunity on how to move forward. Let's not let the uh, controversies and the areas of, uh, of lack of consensus hold us back. We should actually see we know enough to move forward and let's move forward together to make sure that healthy diets is affordable and available to all. This is all I would say. And uh, Lynette, I think we can go on to the session on uh, open the floor for comments and questions from our listeners. They've been listening to us for some time. Now is their opportunity to, to put their questions on the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna, for your wise words. And I just want to remind panelists that we um, want to manage this Q&A session and this discussion via the Q&A box rather than um, opening it up to live microphones. And so uh, that's just simply because we have only min 15 minutes left and we want to make sure we can answer as many questions as possible. So if you haven't done so, please do type your questions. So I'm going to go through some of those that have been um, asked. There have been some that have been responded to already. So if you asked a question, um, please do check the Q&A box again. Some have been answered um, in writing. But I would like to start out with a question to uh, Jean-Claude. Uh, this question comes from Gina Kennedy. As a public health nutritionist, I find there is confusion about the difference between ultra-processed foods and healthy processed foods. It would be helpful to provide some messages around health processed foods, healthy processed foods, since as we know, consumers want convenience, time savings and affordability. I leave that to you to um, comment, thank you. Thank you, thank you, uh, Gina, for your excellent question. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, I think there, are, there is confusion about <clears throat> uh, between uh, ultra processed food and the more healthy processed food. And I think it's, uh, it's quite important today that government uh, uh, plays a role in that because I think we need to indicate clearly to the food industry what are the innovation that we want to have on the market. Uh, if I put myself in the shoes of industry, I, I would like to have a clear uh, indication of what are the changes that are need to be made because industry will not change uh, you know, its product every year. And so generally speaking, I think we need to have government through dietary guidelines to provide this, this clarification information on, on what are healthy foods that are processed and quite beneficial. And, uh, and to me, those are minimally processed foods and, uh, and there's all kinds of great innovation that we can, we can see in the market. But uh, I think that's a crucial point because uh, we cannot afford to uh, uh, struggle with this question for, for, for too long. And um, so, yeah, that's my answer. Thank you. That, that's uh, a very important point. And I'm maybe just going to Anna for a moment. I wondered whether Anna, you'd like to comment about um, uh, Jean-Claude highlighted the role of governments. I would like, I wonder whether you could also highlight the role of international organizations like perhaps FAO or, or Codex and the other bodies that are providing guidance. How, 
do you think those can provide further support uh, to the governments as they as they try to implement this agenda? Um, thank, thank you very much, uh, Lynette. They have a big role in providing uh, the guidance, you know, more like the structures, because very often they put out guidance and then the countries can take these and implement. Sadly, very often these guidance and uh, things they provide are voluntary. So it's not binding. And that's the problem with some of these, because that some of the recommendations that are given are so good that if uh, countries will take them, we will move far. But where is voluntary? Who is going to hold who responsible when nobody takes action? For example, Codex gives guidance on a lot of the elements we have talked about, even processing and all, you know, but it's voluntary. So a country can decide to do it or will, will, will not do it. So they have a big role to play. No doubt they have a big role to play, but we should find ways in which we can monitor and also ways in which we can encourage countries to take some of these guidance that are provided by these international bodies and incorporate them at the country, country level. Otherwise, we will not move forward. We will not move forward at all. Thank you. And uh, Lynette, I have a question here that I picked on the, on the chat that uh, I would like to uh, bring to, to uh, uh, Marcos. He said um, there are two, maybe you can take them together. Okay. One is that people on coastal areas without vegetables, how do we ensure accessibility? Where if we are talking about change in diet, and then also uh, there's concern about the negative consequences of reduction in animal source foods in low income countries. Can you just uh, uh, comment on these two? These were two questions in the, in the chat box. Sure, thank you. Um, the one on coastal areas I responded to in the chat. So okay. um, uh, I think okay, it, it, it asks sort of what to do if there is no access to fruits and vegetables, for That's example, right? right? Mm -hmm. I think it highlights really the critical role of functioning food systems in those situations. And um, having access to healthy and nutritious food sh should not be negotiable, basically. So there really needs to be an investment in properly functioning food systems to make sure there is a diversity of foods available at the local markets. On the other one, um, there needs to, uh, one has to make a differentiation between um, low meat diets that you find that are consumed at the moment, very often in resource poor settings, mm -hmm. um, which are very often not very diverse and would not be uh, in line with actually those dietary recommendations that are laid out and uh, more ideal versions of low, low meat diets. The latter ones, when they are adhered to, are usually found to be nutritionally adequate and healthier than, uh, than current diets. Whereas the other ones, and the um, person asking this question is exactly right, pointing out that those other resource poor diets that are monotonous and just from, from a poor, uh, often affordability perspective, low in animal source foods are very often not nutritionally adequate. So one needs to make a differentiation uh, between those. And it's important that when we mention uh, healthy, more plant-based diets, that we stress that those are uh, nutritionally balanced and uh, made up of a diverse selection of fruits, veg vegetables, and so on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, th thank you very much. And I would like to highlight that even in developed, developing countries, even in my own country where I am now, you know, there are populations who, because economic conditions have improved for them substantially, they are actually moving towards high consumption of, 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 of uh, meat. And you wonder, it's so, uh, you know, it's like, you know, you get money, you have to eat more meat. And that should not the message that should be, because that's how sometimes the population, even in low income countries, are moving too. So I think that balance in, in the message should, should come clear. Thank you very much. Thanks for that. And I think that's a very nice segue into a, um, into a question that was uh, directed to you, uh, Namakolo. And I want to, if, if I may, I'm sorry, Aniki, I'm going to paraphrase and perhaps expand that question a little bit if you if you're, um, allow me to. Um, the question was raised about um, how, um, well, I'm just going to read one part of it. Um, how can we apply and implement those, uh, those traditional and, and indigenous food patterns from Africa to other countries? And I think the question is there a little bit getting at that question of, of um, how do we take that knowledge and how do we 
how do we build on that knowledge and make it contextually uh, appropriate? And I wanted to pick up on that question and then maybe maybe um, build also with what um, others have been speaking about in the changes in dietary patterns that have been happening over time. Um, uh, I think that was you, now I'm, I'm struggling to remember, I think that was you, um, Oh, uh, who showed the map of, uh, yeah, that was you, Namakolo, who showed yes, the map of the world yes, and yes. the colors of the continents. And I wondered if we had gone back 10 years, what would Latin America look like? You know, would Latin America have been greener? So can you talk a little bit about that loss of, of traditional indigenous foods, how we've seen that happening with the nutrition transition and how we can reverse that trend, stop it and, and reverse it in a way that, that contributes both to as we've been discussing nutrition, healthy diets and, and, um, and environmental sustainability of production. Um, yes, indeed. I think the one thing that we, we must do um, is work to describe and characterize these uh, traditional consumption patterns that are positive. Um, and, and, and bring some fame to them as we have done for the Mediterranean diet. Uh, because currently they, they almost looked down on, whereas there are really some, um, some positives that we can pick from them. What is happening now is I think if we, if we go forward, I mean, that work I think was based on uh, probably 2010 or so data, I can't remember now. The, 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 the issue is if we don't do anything, Africa is not going to be green in the few years if we did the same work. And, and, and so we are losing good um, and adopting bad, and we seem to be okay with it. And, and what I'm saying is we should not be okay. The fact that we are now working with a UN Food Systems Summit that wants to work at resetting to transform our food systems in a better direction. It's a time for us to do some stock taking and look at where we are now and say, how can we have those places that are slightly in a better place? How can they stay there? And so the issues of dietary guidelines, the issues of policy instruments really needs to come on board to, to recognize uh, what we need to preserve. And we, we change what we need to change because I'm not saying everything is wonderful, but it's important. Uh, I think it's, it's a very clear example of, it, of the dietary transition. And this is why I picked on those maps because Africa is in, in rapid dietary transition. Mm -hmm. So essentially what that means is we are also losing the green. So let's make the green more famous so that other places can even adopt those uh, consumption patterns. Thank you. Thanks, that, that's great. Um, very happy to hear that. And I think it does challenge us as the, for those of us, as we go back to the pool, about half of the people in the session were from the academic community. And it challenges us to think beyond our typical ways of, of studying and documenting and, and evidence to explore novel ways to bring that attention forward and provide the evidence that that is needed so that it can be showcased uh, further as, as and, and contribute to the broad evidence that we have around around healthy dietary patterns. Um, from there, and I'm going to leave this open to whoever is brave enough to pick up the question. Um, we have a, a question from a colleague, I'm presuming in Nigeria, who asks about mm -hmm. connecting uh, producers of products with with buyers and and the, specific, the question is very specific to, to agro-processed products in Nigeria to the other parts of the world. But I'm just going to leave that question open a little bit. If we have production of, of healthy, minimally processed foods in one place, how do we support small businesses and, and those producers to get them to a point where they can make a living from that production? So I'm going to leave that open to whoever would like to respond. Uh, Jean-Claude, please go ahead first. Uh, well, we, we know that there is some interesting evidence in Brazil and uh, in some African countries where government have been able to link the local agriculture production to the uh, public institution. 
And so, for example, in Brazil, they have the national sc uh, uh, school meal program where they uh, are schools and hospitals are buying their foods from local uh, farmers and they are preparing cooking food uh, in the schools and hospitals. I think this is something that Denmark also did connecting the local food production to the institution uh, uh, system so that government becomes a buyer, an important buyers of foods that are produced in the country. I think this is one uh, key solution. It's not the only one, but definitely it would be great that every country uh, adopts a, a similar model that is local or regional. Um, so it's one, one answer. Would anybody like to add to that? It's a very good example from Brazil. Okay, I think we have time for uh, one more question. Tough, tough choice. Anna, does anything jump out at you that is the yeah. burning question in the yeah. list? Yeah, I see one from one Lucas Pawera. He says, interesting presentation question. The models and the national data averages often hide dozens and sometimes hundreds of regional uh, ethnic diets and food systems within countries. Do you have the capacity and sensitivity to consider these differences in research and policies? I think this is important in light of what Namokolo has said. So I throw this up back. Let's, let's address this, please. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I can, uh, Marco? I can, okay. I can okay. yeah. So I think one of the things that we are not paying enough attention to from an academic standpoint is that we, we need to be looking at subnational contexts and, and, and look at actually even characterizing diets at that level, because we have multiple, I mean, many African countries, my, my work currently is in Ethiopia, and there are multiple agroecological zones where consumption patterns are clearly different. And so each one of those needs to be characterized uh, differently. And our academic institutions locally in, in Africa, they can work with others abroad, but they really need to zero in on that um, mm -hmm. and, and make sure that that information comes to the fore, that we can make use to it. Because mm -hmm. if we don't, it's all part of this bucket of information that we are actually losing that we need. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, fantastic. I think Marcos wanted to say something. Yeah, I mean, then, I couldn't agree more. I think uh, local context is really key to all kinds of things, uh, including um, also decision making at the national level, actually. So I think moving uh, beyond the focus on uh, national analysis that um, uh, has been done so far, it's really important to get a handle on more detailed data. In the past, often that didn't happen because of the lack of data, but on a lot of dimensions, more regional the specific data is being developed uh, from an environmental perspective. We're already uh, close to being there um, with um, more, more regional data being collected, but also on a diet uh, level. And here I can mention, uh, the, the, again, the Tufts University uh, effort on the global dietary database. Maybe we can say a few more words on that. So there, for example, dietary services are differentiated between urban, urban and rural. So that, that helps a bit. And there are other initiatives going on that try to really get uh, to specific city levels, for example, when it comes to dietary patterns and analyzing the health and sustainability implications on those. Um, so yes, very, very key, I would say. Okay, well, we are at our time and uh, we're very grateful to all of the panelists and to my co-host, Anna, uh, for joining us. Um, we will, we've taken notes, we've recorded the session. We will try to make that available. Um, and uh, we're very happy you were able to join us and hope that you enjoyed the session. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank, thank you. you